Uh, Alex Morgan, can you hear me? <clears throat> I, I, I thought I only got invited to your podcast once, and I thought that's be the one I overslept on. If, if I've missed you again, I don't know what I, I don't remember. Um, do I love vodka? Look. Perlova. Perlova vodka. This is my new favorite. I don't love vodka more than podcasts. I'll talk to you all day long. Uh, I love that stuff. I don't know if it's good. Uh, it, it doesn't give me a hangover. It doesn't give me a hangover. Uh, and I have really bad allergies. So I like it. Okay, I'm finding some questions here. Andy, remind me what we were talking about, if you're here. I'll, I'll uh, pick up where I left off. Uh, Tom Mollick, the next Propertarian uh, podcast should be out anytime soon. I know Butch is working on it. He just made a comment that uh, sounds like it's, it's moved him a bit. Uh, I think it's the last one's really, really good, but you know, the, I guess one of the things we run into, thanks Andy, I'll come back to that, um, uh, one of the things we run into is that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a philosopher, and the stuff that's really interesting me, with, to me is the stuff that has to do with epistemology and science and preventing truth, and, you know, the stuff people most want from me, <laughs> well, the public or you guys most want to hear from me is the stuff that's, you know, how is it going to change my life, you know, your life? How, how, how can we affect change? Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, so when I find something really, really interesting, I'm, it's not always the same thing that you guys find really interesting. Um, you know, when you guys talk about stuff that you're passionate about, sometimes it's just not interesting to me too. So, uh, you know, the, the last podcast I think is really, really important, uh, because I think testimonialism is the fun is the greatest uh, of my insights. Testimonialism is the most important one and probably has the most, most enduring impact. I think the rest of it is, uh, interesting too, but I think that's the most, uh, important piece. I want to go back to, uh, excuse me, uh, Tom Mollick, what are you asking? That The first one was, when you, okay, the next pro, so Butch will have that out in the next day or so, I assume. Um, Andy, I was saying that the underclass, uh, paying the underclass to reproduce in a market government, you just, you, there's, there's only, uh, there's trades, so they can't force you by majority rule to give them redistribution. They have to find something you want to buy. Well, I mean, most of us, what we want to buy is better manners from the underclass. We we want normative, you know, we, we want to restore the sacredness to the commons. You know, make it, this is one of the things that church did very well. Church taught us how to be, how to treat the commons as sacred, how to be, how to be calm, how to be uh, uh, proper in church. I mean, it's hard. And so when we go out into the commons, we take that with us. And so this is the one of the values of the Puritan society is to try to take this 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 uh, sacredness and out and treat it in the commons. And this is also what came from our Indo-European history is that we taught, taught, taught uh, we're taught nature was uh, sacred. So these two things come together and they work very very nicely. So uh, most of us what we want is is uh, I'm happy to pay them not to have kids. I don't want to say just like you have you have to respect my property rights for no value. You have to uh, uh, no no value in return. I know that we're all paying for these things and it's asymmetrically valuable. Well, let's just pay them not to have kids, uh, and, and furthermore, let's punish them if they do. 
you know, nobody likes this, but I mean, we've incrementally suppressed all sorts of parasitism throughout human history. And every time we suppress something that seems really normal, like thieving, you know, or, or, or feuding, we suppress that. We even suppressed the duel, which I think was wrong. We suppressed the duel. We took a lot of things that we thought were good, that were moral, that, were, that, that, that should be the way they are because they were traditional, and we suppressed them. So why can't we uh, t look, there's no reason we can't look at more uh, newer kinds or other kinds of, uh, econo of uh, criminal activity or fraudulent activity or parasitic activity. There's no reason we can't um, uh, eliminate those kinds of uh, activity And so by suppression. So I would say let's, let's punish people for having kids that can't afford them because they're creating a moral hazard for us. And let's reward people who have kids that we want to have them and let's uh, ask you know for in exchange for your redistribution we want you to behave you know and uh, moreover let's increase the severity of the punishment you can now uh, the second part of that thing is you can't just like say people be different you know that doesn't help them any um, the real problem we have is the dissolution of the family in, the, in these cultures there's no male discipline there's nobody setting limits and this is what men do. We set limits on each other, and then men take that home, and they set limits on their families. Now, the women don't, and the kids don't like this. Um, and yes, men are very greatly in their ability to do the smart thing. So some of them take it too far, and some of them do not, don't do enough. But we have the institution of the family. The second thing we have is that we, we, we've... Um, asked a lot more of humans. We've asked them to go to school and do a lot more difficult things than just learning through imitation. So one of the things I have a problem with is that is this universal education is treated, it treats us all as equals, when the truth is, is that the major difference between the races and classes is uh, the rates at which we mature uh, and the re uh, in other words, the rates with we, which we can suppress Im uh, Im uh, impulsivity, and secondly, the intensity with which we mature. So, I mean, if you take the Asian kids, there are the reason Asians look like they do, and we make fun of their smaller parts, um, is because they're less sexually mature. Um, they make they live longer. One of the reasons they live longer. We look at uh, whites, that we're uh, more sexually mature, but not all that much. Um, uh, the, and we go all the way to the black uh, community, where they mature really intensely, it's a very, very full maturity, and very early. So we try to educate all these people in the same process, instead of developing um, uh, environments where they can learn and function as they need to. Um, you know, to take, I always figure that my kid is a lot like, is not like me. He's, a, he's, a, he's more like his cousin, and he's a pretty aggressive guy. Um, he's got my mind kind of mind, but he's a pretty aggressive guy, and he doesn't, he won't put up with stuff. He'll smack you in the, when he was little, he would smack you if you were out of line. Um, whereas I was a kid, I was just like, yeah, you're too stupid. And so uh, this is the problem, is we don't create environments that are, that are uh, permissible for the kind of behavior we're trying to uh, adapt. So I always see it as, we can't just like force people to be different without helping them. And so my view is, pay people to not have kids, pay, them, pay some people to have kids, um, pay people for morals, and in, in order, I mean, moral behavior in the commons, and let's put schools together that accurately reflect the needs of different groups. Uh, Alex, explain to me how propertarianism uh, deals with fraud. Well, uh, fraud, I actually don't think fraud is a problem because we've done fairly well at uh, eliminating uh, fraud, uh, direct fraud. In other words, we've uh, not only uh, built a really good body of law for prohibiting fraud, but we've also created, at least in the commercial marketplace, um, the requirement for implied warranty. So even if you, even if you, uh, you're not actually, you actually have positive obligations to make sure the other party's well informed. And so I, uh, fraud isn't the problem. The problem is, is when we get beyond uh, you and I talking and into indirection. So where we have uh, public speech that is <clears throat> advocating, uh, advocating uh, collective parasitism. Or we have informational asymmetry. So uh, I would say that we just use natural law, which is I've tried to put out. And natural law in my world is a very specific thing. It means non-parasitism, fully informed, 
productive, in other words, it's got to be productive, bank, uh, blackmail isn't productive, fully informed, productive, or warranted, uh, voluntary transfer, free of, ex free of uh, limited to externalities that are also fully informed, warranted, productive, and voluntary. So as, as this is basically the, the moral rule. So we can, we can, if we, the problem we had before is we had no criteria, no test, no test in law that we could put into place that said, well, if you perform these warranties, then, you know, you've basically said the truth. We have it for material things, for material harm, but we didn't create, we have it for fraud, because fraud's fairly easy to detect because it's an interpersonal thing, but we didn't get to indirection, which is uh, which ex externalities or external consequences, and we didn't get to um, very cunning kinds of fraud, uh, asymmetries of knowledge, etc. And so uh, what I'm saying is let's just put those warranties into place so that testimonial, uh, testimonial uh, six dimensions of testimonial testing are required for you to warranty what you say. And I think that, you know, it doesn't matter what you and I talk about trash talk in the bar or trash talk on the here on the Internet, but when we're talking about political matters in the public sphere, we're publishing something into the market for information, and that's stuff we need to be able to uh, regulate. So I would say we can, re if you know, if you understand that, we can just put it into law like we've regulated everything else. Arthur uh, Colon is hope that's okay. Arthur Coloni says, "Do you think modal logic is a valid way of acquiring knowledge?" And what would you say to empiricists? Um, I think that the word "valid" is ridiculous. I think that logic is a subset of reality meant for testing logical statements outside of reality, and uh, and I think that if you're going to make a truth claim about the world that uh, you can find out, you can use whatever tools exist you want, any kind of logic, any kind of free association, whatever you want. It doesn't make any difference how you come up with your idea. What matters is, does it survive those tests? Now, if you're, it, tests, it survives categorical consistency, consistency and it consists, cons, uh, survives logical consistency, that's great, but it's not enough. You can't claim it's true, you can just claim it's logically consistent. So, this is where you get into the difference between what can I, what tools can I use to come up with things, and then what tools do I use to criticize it to make sure I'm correct. And my view is that you know uh, most of philosophy is nonsense because uh, it, it, it's it's a wonderful tool for not doing due diligence on the rest of this uh, testimonial spectrum. So you know, I, there's no valid anything. There's just whether it survives or not. Uh, I don't know. James Louis LaSalle. I don't know what that means. Please what? Please say some videos. Ask me a question, buddy. Don't ask me to go look at a video when I'm talking to people. Um, Matt Wayne. What could a social club of right-wingers do to help bring about more aristocrat... Nothing. Blo you know what this does? This is good for educating, but what brings about a right order... In other words, what it brings about limits on behavior is violence. So you can, you, can, you can get over the fact that, can I get together with some people and make each other feel better? You can't. What you can do is you can get with a bunch of people out there and you can impede the economic, impede the political, and impede the infrastructure uh, systems so that uh, your demands are met. So what I want to give you is demands that you can, things that you can demand, and I want to give you solutions for how to conduct an insurrection. My belief, and this is what my plan is, my belief is that we, if we make it believable enough that all this is going to happen, that it's preferable not, it's preferably to choose those models. And so I don't believe a social club where you get around what is going to work. And the reason is, is that conservatives, we're like, we're like a division of very precise labor, and the progressives are not. They sacrifice individual behavior to conform to the, to the group, whereas conservatives and libertarians, we diverge from the group. So you're, when you get a bunch of us together, everybody's got an opinion, they think they're right. You get a, bu a bunch of progressives together, everybody sacrifices whether they're right in order to make progress. So social groups don't do, any, don't do me much interest. What I think you, we, our job is we create a, a constitution. Um, that's our set of demands. We issue those demands, and we go out and create problems. <laughs> Hi, 
I don't know if I want to answer this. Um, Jeremy Mackle, how do you create, how do you, how do we communicate proprietarianism to the women in our lives? Is it a futile task or is it a sort of methodology for bridging the gap? Uh, you don't convince somebody with an, a polar opposite uh, re, uh, uh, reproductive strategy and a polar opposite mentality, mind structure, value system, intuition system that's designed to advance that reproductive strategy to agree with you. What you do is you conduct a trade. If you haven't got anything to trade, you're not going to convince them to compromise. If you have something to trade, it's great. Well, what the left does is they raise the, ask the, the specter of violence against us, and what the right has done is tolerate their immaturity in the hope that they'll mature, and that was the, the hopeful generation of conservatism that just failed cata catastrophically. Our, our job is to be the hopeless or the resigned <laughs> generation or the empirical generation. We're now faced with facts. And so with those facts, we know you can't convince anybody. What you can do is you can eliminate the ability for them to get their way except by exchange. And so that's what I think we need to do is we actually eliminate the ability to extract from us um, and we force them to the table to negotiate with us. And uh, this is all we can really do. Uh, I, I don't know how you're going to do that with your with your girlfriend. I don't know. Women have women are strange. <laughs> the way you do it is uh, so. I'm I, I'm gonna I'm not, I'm not going to cop out on that. I'm actually going to going to try to answer it. The way I handle it is this: is I say um, uh, your happiness is important to you, and it's important to me. My happiness is important to me and it needs to be important to you. If we're conducting exchanges so that's mutually beneficial, then that's good, right? Because we each compromise, even though we don't get what we want totally, we get most of what we want. Well, the same thing is to do with government. Right now, you can get together with a bunch of women, because that's what happens, and you can tilt a vote. And by doing that, you can uh, get what you want, even though we can't get what we want. So you were prohibited by uh, majority rule from negotiating with you and into a trade and we're forced into the position with you of having a of, of just letting you extract from us so uh, what I don't think that's fair and my question is if we could conduct a trade and we could compromise and that would make us both happy and even though we might not be as happy uh, as we could be we're ha the ha happiest as it's possible to be without conflict and I think this is the way you describe it to women, and they'll, they can usually grasp this. Um, you're not going to get past a woman's biological imperative because women are designed not to have that much agency. If they had mu that much agency, do you think it's rational to take care of a child? I mean, the amount of sacrifice a woman puts into that, I mean, the women can't have the kind of agency we have. If they had, we, there wouldn't be any humans. Uh, James LaSalle, explain this dismissive assumption about rules and rituals. She turns to... Uh, 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 there's something missing from your question here, James. I can't uh, answer it. <clears throat> After this rant about underclass, I can see how much conservative, libertarian, and progressive evolutionary strategy are maladaptive for the modern... Mm, I don't think strategies are maladaptive. I think institutions don't facilitate who we are. And so uh, this is why I folks say that, you know, uh, uh, simple people talk about a must, uh, 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 well-meaning fools talk about morality, uh, you know, people with a little understanding talk about law, and the rest of us talk about institutions. We talk about incentives. How do we create institutions so people can bring things together. So it's not that we're maladaptive, it's that we were wrong. Democracy is a horrible idea. We had the perfect government. Monarch as, as, ju as judge, um, but disempowered, can't do anything positive, can only resolve conflicts. A house of lords for the people who had multiple generations of successes. A house of commons for the small and medium-sized businessman, for the commerce. And, you know, we, we had the church. What we didn't do is we didn't create a house of labor and then a house of women. If we had, we'd have had a market for the classes and their different reproductive strategies. And we could continue to trade. Uh, the other thing we got is we got made the mistake of majority assent, which means that we have to get a majority to agree to do something rather than 
Well, if anybody wants to conduct any trade at all, I can dissent by saying that's a violation of um, law, but there's no reason to concentrate all our resources behind one choice. The, the same thing, I was talking about this in Seattle. We had this you know, light rail versus monorail um, debate. And when I, when I look at the monorail debate, I'm like, well, I want a monorail because, you know, this other things are dirty and they're loud and you know, they have drunk people on them and, you know, they're just dirty. And so I said, well, the monorail is kind of nice. They keep it clean. It's up in the air. It's kind of quiet. It doesn't, you know, it's, and so, uh, you know, I said, why do we have to choose one or the other? Why can't we have both? And whichever one succeeds works out. Well, the reason is because the monorail people would use and the light rail they wouldn't, but the mon mon but the uh, light, the light rail is going to create more use for the uh, state. So, you know, this is where I get into this monopoly stuff is nonsense. We just need a market for the trade of things between classes. So it's our, our problems, our institutions, and our illogical adherence to our past. Edward first, can you go through the, se the six tests of testimonial truth? I'm always skeptical about bridging freedom of speech moral hazard crazy. Well, you know, uh, you know, it's actually the, the thing about these uh, six steps and Butch is really, this is this next con this next uh, piece Bush is putting out has me go into this in a lot of detail. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to quickly touch on these subjects here, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to refer to you to the podcast that's about to come out because I, I really go into a lot of detail and uh, since I got across to Butch, I think I think it'll probably get across to everybody else. The six tests are categorical, you know most of these, categorical consistency, there's non-conflation, logical consistency, internal consistency, uh, empirical consistency, external consist uh, consistency, um, operational consistency, which means existential possibility, and that you're not switching by this cute word is between experiential and action and other frames of reference, that you're being consistent in your, op in your frame of reference, and that frame of reference demonstrates that the, the existence of the thing you're talking about is actually possible. Now, that's actually easy. Scientists do it all the time. You can read about E prime. You just got to learn, how, basically, if you learn how to not use the word is, that's like half of it. Um, after that, you get moral consistency, which we think in libertarians very naturally. You need to have uh, reciprocity, the uh, fully informed, voluntary, uh, fully informed, pr productive, fully informed, voluntary transfer, free of externalities or limited to externalities, the same. Well, that's that's the next one. And uh, so that you have inter you have categorical, internal, external, op or existential, um, moral, and the last one is scope. A scope's a little bit uh, not really that complicated. It just means what are the limits. Uh, at what point does this begin to succeed and what point does this begin to fail and uh, have you fully accounted for everything that happens inside it? This is the problem we get into economics. It doesn't deal with full accounting. So humans perceive property in toto, which means all sorts of kinds of property, and we're conscious of the up and down in all these different kinds of properties. And economists just worry about consumption, current consumption, and they don't track what happens uh, to... Uh, genetic capital, normative capital, cultural capital, institutional capital, and how what's happening. And what's happening, of course, is we're spending it down. We've just really screwed it up. And so um, uh, that's what we've done. With, so that, that's what full accounting is. So if you take those and you actually try to say something that's all that's consistent, in other words, consistent means deterministic. Deterministic means regular. That means everything is correspondent with what you're saying in every dimension. Then it's very hard, actually, to engage in sins. Error, bias, wishful thinking, suggestion, uh, obscurantism, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, suggestion overloading, obscurantism, and pseudoscience, which is really the same thing. Um, and deceit. It's very hard to do that. And so I don't think it's so much of you have to do things this way. I'm saying if you can go do those things with any degree of accuracy, it's actually very hard to believe yourself, you know, to not, to, it's hard to get past that and not understand that you're wrong. As a child developed, uh, Louis LaSalle, as a child develops, Douglas explains, his experience flows into a grid of Role categories, right and wrong. As he himself has seen only in relation to the structure. And this is progressive criticism of unthinking conformism. Uh, okay. I 
still don't. I know I'm frustrating you, buddy, but I don't know what you're asking me. Um, uh, Sini McHugh, Obama for third term, national emergency dispense. No, that's I don't. That's nonsense. Um, uh, William Joseph Crater. That sound like Bix nudes red sinking. Uh, help me out, bud. Ulysses Cartwright. How can we morally and efficiently suppress the reproduction of those with traits that are harmful? Well, you know, it's you don't have to do it by uh, opinion. You can do it by demonstrated results. I mean, if you can't support yourself, you can't hold a marriage together. You can't support yourself. You're a single. You have a single income and a kid, and you do, you require uh, additional financial support. That's a problem. I think that uh, you know it, it's probably true that below. Uh, 90, we have a problem, IQ problem, which is certainly true below 85 or 80. It is certain, not, not questionably true. It's totally true below 80. Um, uh, we probably should should do something about that. Uh, I'm I'm a little less comfortable with IQ testing, and I'm more comfortable with uh, demonstrated activity because you can get a not very bright person that has a good character, and they can go out and and build a productive life. There's plenty of people who do that. They aren't. They they maybe have low IQs, but they're they're not bad people. The problem is when you get low IQ and impulsivity and aggression and early sexual maturity, right, and and uh, no institutional support in order to help train that person into constraining those issues that he's been born with. What is that terrifying thing on your bookshelf? <laughs> That's. Oh. It's my, it's a, it's a Halloween mask. <coughs> I like to take that mask and uh, drive around in my Porsche with the top down and see what reactions I get. Alex Morgan, do you recommend trying to find a woman from the ex-Soviet nations? Well, uh, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, you know Slavic women. Uh, we you know if you go to the Nordic peoples, there there is that argument that people in the north are about equally male, male, men and women are about equally right. Uh, it's the same. People in the Slavic nations, women are just a little bit better, and then in the rest of the world, everybody's equally not good. Um, now that's not quite true, but I, I always think it's kind of a funny way of looking at the world. Um, uh, the thing you get in the uh, tradition. I, I, it's not so much uh, genetics, although I, you, know, you find beautiful people in every every uh, culture. You find unattractive people in every culture. What you have in the traditional societies, especially over here, Slavic countries and in the post-Soviet countries, is uh, masculinity stayed masculine and femininity stayed feminine. Feminine. You have all the low trust stuff and all the goofy behavior, but you still have family, femininity, and masculinity, and people just seem to be less nuts here. You know, you go to America and it's like half the women are, I mean, literally, 40% of women have been on antidepressants. Um, the uh, the number of women we run into that are absolute batshit crazy is, is you know, it's just seems like it's the majority these days. It's when you find a sane one, you think you're, you're lucky, but, you know, you, you don't find any of that behavior here. The reason is that people get attention. Mothers give children a lot of attention. They're probably way more talented. I mean, I grew up in a pretty martial, f structured family, an old Puritan style family. You know, you're, you're, and uh, but here they like they're doting. They t they give a lot of affection, but the kids don't seem all panicked for attention. They aren't trying to e e emote a lot in order to to direct attention by bad means. Um, you know, you can have brothers smack each other in the head, but it's there's not all this built-up rage that we have in our society, frustration built up, because we're all, uh, we're, we don't get enough attention from family. And so what I like about this culture is that. You know, and I'll go with the low trust thing and the corrupt government and the potholes in the street simply because I like it. I like that part of it. Um, now, the real re reality is, is that over here, you eat a meal a day and you snack on two others. And so, you're right, uh, smoking is common, but it's not as common as you think it would be. And people walk a lot. So, I mean, the people are pretty f good shape. They don't, they don't eat sugars, they eat fats. And so the, you know, Ukrainian food is great for you. Um, and so between those, between those uh, different characteristics, it just seems like you end up with less craziness. 
Now, the problem is you can bring your Western craziness here. You know, we sound crazy to the locals. Now, I'm a little bit nuts, really. But um, our value system is wrong, and they, they feel it. They like us because we have money and experiences, but they can feel that our, to them our value system is wrong. Yeah, they're less feminist because, you know, on the other hand, here's the deal. In the, in what happened in the, by the, around the 1970s in America is we started mating by entertainment. In other words, how much we like to beat each other as friends and do stuff together instead of mating for economic reasons. And so what happened is, uh, you know, you, that, that destroyed a lot of interdependence and roles. And what you've got here is women have, they don't need to, they don't feel this need to be men. They're proud of being women because they think men are inferior. Um, they sort of see us as gorillas, you know, uh, that ha they have to be tolerated. Um, and they don't feel guilty about having irrational emotions. They don't feel guilty about saying, I just, I'm a woman, I just need to love. It doesn't matter what anything else. I don't have to be understandable or anything. I just need to love. So you hear all these kinds of things, that, that, and, and you hear the men, they're like, well, the men don't have the problems of this bill. You know, if you start off trash talking with a guy here, you get drunk, you don't get this instant hostility thing. Like, because nobody's trying to look for an opportunity to look heroic or get attention. What you get instead is you get these guys coming along and say, you know, they'll humor you until you get out of line and then they'll hit you. I just think it's, it's a better quality of life. Uh, Devin, infinity and mathematical Platonism. No. <laughs> What is your outsider opinion of American politics by Marty Goldrich? Um, I don't. Why am I an outsider? I'm an American. <laughs> um, uh, I think America is a very dysfunctional country that needs to be broken up into different regions because what's happening is is we create a system where you have to lie, and in order to fix that, we've got to get we've got to get out to where we're no longer trying to lie to get power. We're essentially just responding to our communities. Load a balix. I don't know what that means. Uh, are Matye Lovric, we are close. Are we close to Internet of Things? Have you read? No, I don't. Uh, you know, uh, Internet of Things is deterministic. I actually don't think it's that interesting. Um, it's obvious. It's a business opportunity. So I see it as a business opportunity. You know, uh, but I'm not. You know, I, I'm still in the thing of I can't figure out what's much better about my iPhone in the current version than I had in like 2003 with Windows Phone. You know, I mean, I, I can do all the same stuff. It's prettier. I got higher resolution graphics. Um, but I don't, I don't really see that it's any better. And, and I sort of see this in general. I, 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 don't, I don't see a lot of very interesting stuff coming out of the Internet of Things that isn't kind of obvious. Uh, Butch says, Propertarian Podcast 3 should be out soon. He's got uh, to do some editing. That's good. Thanks, Butch. You're, you're amazing. Uh, Bush, Bill Jocelyn, can you elaborate on commons creation? Well, uh, we create commons. You know, we create property rights. We create, uh, create rule of law. We create defense. We create all sorts of things uh, through the commons. And uh, It's really simple. It's private property. Share, uh, there's a private property, a family community property, shareholder property, and common property. And there's stuff that's not your property. <laughs> anyway, and uh, uh, common property just means it's a shareholder, but the shareholder shares aren't articulated, and they're equally distributed. So uh, that means that um, it's citizenship. I get one vote, I get one share, I get one distribution on it. That's all it is. So uh, the, the major difference in citizenship is I can't sell that share, um, but I have an, it's basically and I have an interest. And so when I, uh, I don't say, I, it doesn't give me any particular rights. So we can decide what those rights are. There's lots of rights to put across in, in, uh, in, in natural law. But uh, the major difference being that uh, 
if I leave the community, it's gone. If I engender in the community, I get it. Um, and I have to obey whatever rules there are. But, you know, we pay for commons. We, 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 uh, I wonder what that is for a minute. I thought it was a person that scared me. Um, uh, we, we, uh, a commons is anything that you forego an opportunity on. You don't do in order to create a common good, as well as anything you do do. Like, you, you don't lie, cheat, steal, uh, steal the property. You don't uh, do immoral things. You don't do unethical things. You don't use bad manners. Um, th those are all things you don't do in order to pay for the co for the normative commons. And then we have physical commons, things you create. And then we have promises of, of uh, material commons. I promise I will defend and the promise I will uh, fight and provide services. So we can create... Uh, uh, we create um, the commons through foregoing opportunities, uh, uh, direct contribution, and uh, promises of contribution in time of need. Of course, I don't sound like I'm from Ukraine. I'm from Seattle. I came here because in Seattle, a programmer is $200,000 fully loaded. In Ukraine, the same guy is $36,000 fully loaded. So if you want to build a really big ERP, which I did, um, it, you can pay for it out of your pocket if you got some money instead of going to investors and losing three quarters of your business. Is subjective a subset of objective? No, it's a point of view. Um, uh, subjective includes how you feel about it, and objective is when you've laundered anything that is an opinion from something. I think there's going to be institutional balkanization before regional balkanization. Interesting. Let's do. Let's just let's just force the regional balkanization. What are the possibilities of a new crusade? Crusade. Um, uh, I think it's sort of deterministic at this point that we've enough of us around the world have agreed that this is in this is not going to last. Uh, the problem is uh, we actually need a, a little more crisis to tip it over. And uh, I actually think the American the American uh, uh, problem of our government right now and our shitty leadership and the problem of Merkel that'll be solved. Um, and I think we'll see it after that. Why is Rawls such a shit writer? Because when you lie in philosophy, you have to write shitty. Because if you wrote, so if you wrote analytically, that's what would happen. Uh, really good stuff. Juan Fernando, property, pesos, and obligations. Very good. That's smart. Uh, Sounds solid. Rod Long has a defense of common property to free society. That's great. <clears throat> I want to get over the free society nonsense. The reason we have governments is really is because somebody's eventually got to make decisions when there's no decision, when decisions got to get made and there's no possible other means of doing it. And this is most likely happens when you're negotiating with other states. We're always going to have a state department of some sort. <coughs> because so you have to be able to eliminate conflict by having people decide on behalf of people. You have to. You're just going to have that. That's not a, that's not a <coughs> libertarians are crazy. It's not worth it. The narco recrap, uh, recrap. <laughs> ouch, <laughs> Freudian slip. The narco capitalism program was successful in that by, by thinking how do we do without government, we learned um, uh, a lot about what how we could build a government, a good good build a, a society with good government. But uh, the idea that we'll have a society without government uh, is is like saying we're going to have any society without a judge. And it's not going to happen. Well, you know the problem with we had with the Crusades, Davin, is that you know. Uh, we had the Justinian plague and the total collapse of the Mediterranean economy. Um, you know, I mean, that's a different argument. Um, John Edward Pellish. Are you going to meet with Weave? I don't know who Weave is. I don't need more friends to meet with. 
Uh, is the USA in danger of hyperinflation in the next few years? Uh, you know, I have more faith in um, <coughs> the ability of the world to conspire to maintain the dollar uh, by hook and crook, just like they maintain the Roman Empire, uh, because the idea of not having it is pretty bad. Um, my feeling, though, is that, uh, you know, if Russia and uh, Iran and uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia do form sort of some alliance there that they will create a patro currency because you got to understand that between the between the Arctic uh, just uh, north and northeast of Moscow and Saudi Arabia that's where all the oil is right there not all but I mean that's where the stuff that's cheap to get out of the ground is and so uh, the natural place to have a currency is based out of there. And if we do that, the average American is going to get hurt really bad. So I'm going to, can I flip this around? Um, I don't like it when people, conservatives and libertarians, engage in wishful thinking that some tra tragedy is going to happen. I always think of it as, 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 as the sin of wishful thinking. And it's it, there's there's no way out of this, guys. There's there's no there's no there's no happy way out. Nobody's gonna solve this problem for us. It's one way you're gonna get solved. You gotta you take this and you drink it over with your friends, and then you fill this and a whole bunch. You know what's really good Miller Light bottles because they break, and you fill them with gasoline and you put some soap suds in there, and then you put a piece of rag inside, and then you throw this at things. And when you do that, they burn. Fire is our friend. You know, really, you take that, you throw some chain, chain link over electrical power cables, um, you take a bunch of old shells, put them together, wrap them in, uh, put, a, put the, the lighter in from a um, ro model rocket engine, put that under a, ga a gas main. You, those are the things you do, and you bring it to a halt. You, 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 put, you pour uh, buckets of... Uh, of nails over uh, roofing nails over large stretch, stretches of, of central highway. I mean, it's not complicated. The way you bring a change about is you re, is you create you you destroy the thing that is most fragile. And the most fragile thing we have is there's three hours of power. There's seven days worth of food and like maybe two days two or three days worth of uh, excuse me it's 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 electricity power uh, three hours uh, three days water and you know one week of food that's it I mean the Mormons aren't crazy they know what they're doing um, there's it's very easy to, to create widespread panic and when people tell me that the, the government's so powerful I'm like yeah really look at the DC sniper did and I think that's actually pretty horrible because it was indiscriminate um, but the point is, is that the way you create a revolution is you use is you stop talking, and you do stuff. Um, relative commotion is ex asks my one of my favorite questions. Do you subscribe to any particular theory of mind? Well, um, I subscribe to. The, uh, uh, the, the least, when you're talking about a thing like the mind, you have to break it into something you can understand because the, it's like one of those chains. There's a lot of components in there, and it's like if you go inside and look at all these little pieces, it doesn't really, it's one of those problems where it doesn't inform you about the forest when you study the tree too much. So I have a very uh, simple, uh, free, uh, so I think it's a simple model for the mind, and and it's and uh, and I don't think that there's any further improvement on that model that's going to really matter for the purpose of cooperation. You know, ethics, epistemology, ethics, economics, and politics. I think what we're in this phase of, which Butch is going to talk about uh, or show in this next uh, video, this next podcast that comes out, is that you know we're in the phase where we're trying to eliminate error, not necessarily identify new concepts and <clears throat> so I think we're going to find more detail like more cognitive biases and more properties of our limits but in general if I say I have a theory of mind and I think it's pretty accurate it goes something like this you have your genes your genes push 
biases into your uh, weights on your uh, on, the, on different kinds of property, in other words, calories. Your uh, these uh, uh, I call that they uh, they call that system zero. System one is your intuition. Your intuition basically functions as search engine, just like moving your arms. You can't see into it. You can't see into the search engine. And then you have reasons that sits on top of that, and reason we use uh, to guide that search engine and to do comparisons with it. Um, that's very, very simple. Uh, propertarianism says that all these values that we have, whether they're uh, psychological, uh, individual, whatever, they all have to do with uh, changes in the state of property. Now, I use the word property where you could talk, use the word assets or things we value, but it basically comes down to stuff we acted upon. And so uh, I just view the mind as a property uh, acquisition, retention system, and our communication with one each other as very polite protocol for uh, looking for opportunities to acquire, looking for opportunities to uh, cooperate so that we can further our acquisition. And this seems to be a fairly accurate description of humanity, although it is somewhat dehumanizing to realize we're just, you know, acquisition machines, and uh, our personalities and our feelings and our thoughts and our emotions and all the stuff we talk about are just, like, ways of entertaining ourselves to make the ride more fun. <clears throat> How does it relate to operationalism? Operationalism is really an epistemological problem to make sure that we don't, we are not uh, fooling ourselves by pretending that we understand things that we don't. And so if you can't state things as a sequence of uh, operations that are existentially possible, this means that you're imagining something. Now, if you, if you say, that, well, I'm imagining this, that's one thing, but if you claim it's true, that's a different thing altogether. And if you're trying to commit fraud by claiming it's true, that's something else. And what we're concerned about, or what I'm concerned about in propertarianism is, is I want to get rid of the century and a half of lies which have been used to attack Western civilization. And so I'm interested in the part where we prevent the fraud. Edward, John Edward Pellich, have you read about Geothean science? No. Is there any hope for Africa? Absolutely. Uh, I actually think, it, I mean, I think most people who study Africa think it's fa doing fantastically. I don't know. Um, you know, you, you're not going to solve uh, uh, problems that take, uh, you know, people have got to die before changes can be implemented. I mean, there's generational problems. It's the same thing they say in Ukraine here. There's, well, the easiest thing to do is just wait till the, the current generation dies off, and then we'll have better people to work with. It kind of sucks for the people in the middle, but, you know, eventually you do get there. I think Africa looks fine to me. I don't, I don't say, uh, you know, that, that's it. Um, I, again, you asked me about Hegel. I don't take uh, philosophers seriously. I don't read philosophers except to try to figure out how people screwed up, really. Um, I read science. And uh, Hegel uh, tried to create uh, his vision. I think there's some really good things in it. Um, but again, I have a constant, uh, I have a very uh, visceral and committed antagonism to uh, uh, the German model of uh, conflationary philosophy. If you want to write fantasy stories and literature, do that, tell us about myths. If you want to write science, do that and tell us about science. But let's not bring these things together. <clears throat> Heger, you talked about relating to the organization of the organs, hierarchy of classes and thoughts. What do you think about bourgeois <laughs> I can't figure out if you're insulting me or not. I don't know how to answer this question. I would say this, is that, I'm going to answer your qu qu question, your, uh, uh, Mr. Heger, I'm going to answer your question uh, <clears throat> practically. I'm actually going to answer it. And that is that, um, uh, look, we have short-term time preference women, we have medium-time time preference libertarians, and we have long-term conservatives. 
and uh, you can call each other wrong, and that's and that's where you're mistaken. Uh, each of us is calculating a need or generating demand, um, and it's up to us to to trade with each other to satisfy demand. Now the problem is we've got an institutional system that doesn't allow us to trade with each other, and so we get basically the worst possible outcome, which is the short-term time preference. And American first-past-the-post voting ensures this is going to be wrong, uh, whereas you get the sort of German model uh, with a professional bureaucracy, and you get um, uh, the, the, the ability to have multiple parties that stay in power and actually bring uh, policy to fruition over time. Now, this tends to be a little bit better, but I'd, I'll, I'll, of course I'd recommend that we just deal with market commons. Are you an a Kurt Jer J uh, Jeremy Mackel? Are you an atheist or an agnostic? Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm a practicing Catholic. Um, I uh, talk to God every day, and I know that sounds really crazy to people, but I do. Um, I ask for wisdom every day, and I don't find that particularly difficult. Now, I have a very esoteric concept of God, and uh, you might say that it's not God at all. Uh, but the fact that I talked, that I use the concept of God, uh, it works for me. So uh, that's where I am. Uh, do I believe in church? Absolutely. Do I believe in the church's academic side? Well, if you read the, read the Catholic Encyclopedia sometime, it's pretty good stuff. Um, what? Now, what I object to is uh, the deceits that are in Christianity. And I object to submission. Um, and so uh, there's parts of Christianity I want to eradicate. I want to eradicate of lies. And I prefer that when we go to church, it's more like sacred school. And we learn about all the moral and good things in our history that were done by each class, not just the spiritual one. And I'd like us to do that. I'd like that church was and it was not only uh, a, a university and school, but I'd like it was our bank, and I'd like it was our sheriff, where our sheriffs worked. I'd like to see our churches be more like uh, a universities. You know, take a university together, a school system together, with a credit union and a militia. Um, and I think that would that would be a nice world. To, and I can think of how to make that happen, believe it or not, in our uh, current, as a transitional process in our, uh, in our uh, civilization. Um, I think we're going to make them go away. <laughs> Liam, uh, Liam Youngman, I think we're going to make them go away, and I think we have to make them go away. Uh, I think I know how to make them go away, uh, without by changing our current system pretty easily, and I actually don't think it's very difficult. I don't know, Alex. You know, I'm not a political teacher. I, I basically look at data, um, and uh, that's all there is. And I don't know, Alex. I don't know the uh, if Hillary's uh, speech is her Ceausescu moment. Uh, I think that she's she believes she can run out the clock. Before Trump uh, gets the gets his uh, restructures his campaign and uh, takes it to uh, positive, and and I and and she's she might be right. And what uh, I was complaining about, you know, they don't listen to me, but what I was complaining about is he didn't start that early enough. He needed to start that in May. Um, when you, what you basically do is you stay on point until you win the election, the, win the uh, nomination. But you actually have to have another crew setting up the positive policy recommendations. So starting in August, you can go on the attack. And my feeling is because Trump was so confident in his ability to win, be, because he was controlling the media, um, he thought he could do that same thing by himself. And by the time he realized it, it was too late. I don't know what to stop the crisis means. <clears throat> Al, I like this personal format for communicating ideas. I find your written work uh, emotionally cold and unapproachable. It's supposed to be! Um, uh, I write proofs. 
you know, uh, when I write a work, I'm making an argument. I'm trying to write a proof, and I want it to hold up, and I want it to end up in my book. Uh, but, you know, I love to talk to you guys. And so um, I just didn't know this forum was available for me until today. Um, what I like about uh, talking to you is when I have one of you in my head and I have a question, I can sort of figure out where your mind is and how to present it. When I'm t making a proof, I'm not really doing that. I'm, I'm writing an argument that I want to be durable, and I may have to write it 10 or 15 times to get to where it is durable. When it's durable, it doesn't have any nice stuff in it. It just is. Um, relative commotion, why not Protestant? Well, you know, uh, you know, you are not going to, you are not going to get people anymore to go to talk to about Christian whatever. It's kind of silly. You're going to get people who need it in that format, and and I'll tell you why. Um, and I don't want to insult anybody, but basically, religious morality stays relatively constant, but religiosity goes down, goes up as IQ goes down. And one of the reasons for this is, is Dunning-Kruger. So uh, as your intelligence goes down, especially below, uh, below 100, um, what happens is it gets very hard to trust people who's, what they're telling you. And so you can only trust people at your level to give you information in the format that you can understand. What religious, what religious mysticism does, it creates an authority that pushes out to everybody the same narrative. But the truth is that narrative is merely allegorical to people at the top. It's, it's kind of silly and it's kind of childlike, like fairy tales. But what happens to the people at the bottom is it makes a common language for them to talk to people higher up. And so it removes this problem of mistrust. Now, my view is that we don't need to do this with uh, lies. We can do this with truths. Because I don't actually believe it's that difficult to reduce natural law to something people can understand or to, to convert that natural law into parables that people can understand. I don't think that's very, very difficult. And so I don't see any reason to hold on to this nonsense Christianity. I think you can do what Jefferson did, take the Jefferson Bible, uh, convert uh, Jesus' teachings into very common moral traditional language, and we can use, uh, we can get spirituality out of the continu continuity of civilization, the continuity of time, our progress toward transcendence to become closer to the gods we want to be. And I, and I think this is something that people can, people will go to if we create other incentives other than wasting an hour on your Sunday morning. Um, and so this is what I want to be able to do, is I want to be able to, to say, how do we take away from the state these things and use uh, our, use our history as our religion, and with this religion, resist attacks against our people. Terry Ann Yao, if they can teach evil, call it history when it... <clears throat> I'm going to try to turn this. If they can teach evil, call it history when it killing that is... Ga uh, sorry, sweetie, I, I, I know that you want to say something there, but you got to say it in, in better English, because I can't... Uh, I can't try to figure it out uh, for people. Maybe somebody can help her translate it. Uh, cycles. Uh, I, I understand, Devin, I understand cycle theory uh, at the uh, civilization level, at the generational level, and at the epistemological level. And I understand these cycles work. I understand that the reason they exist is that we all grow through a, a knowledge cycle from ignorance to wisdom, so to speak, from youth and uh, optimism to uh, uh, age and uh, skepticism. I know we do that. And then I know that in each era, we react to the status quo in our current era and that these things form cycles. And I know that about every hundred years, we forget everything. And this process continues in a sort of running hundred year window, four generation window over human conceptualism. And so uh, whenever, th we, whenever one generation feels that one of its founding narratives is being gone, they get really upset and whatever. But general, this, this stuff goes forward. The same thing happens in civilizations. Uh, the pro uh, civilizations grow to the point where they've, uh, they, they have an original idea, a founding idea, 
this idea is a technological advantage. And then they, uh, they go forward and uh, they exhaust the opportunity created by that idea. And so civilizations tend to go through cycles. Um, what generally happens is you, one of the following things happen. Uh, you lose, uh, this is the important one, which is where I think Diamond gets it wrong all the time. The one you, what you do is you, ex, you, 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 your population and your consumption surpass your means of uh, institutional regulation. In other words, you get to the point where morality and law and all these things break down because of all the, you know, of all, there's just too much, too, not enough information system to manage the economy of that size. The second thing that happens is you grow to where you get to the point where you say, you get, you get some population and uh, their, their rents, this is what happens most of the time in, uh, in the Middle East it seems, is that the rents expand, I always think it's heat related, it's temperature related, R rents expand to the point where there's, when you encounter a shock, there's no free resources able to reorganize the society. And I think that's what happens. Uh, that's pretty common. Those shocks tend to be environmental, uh, trade, uh, trade route impacts, uh, war and plague. Um, and the last ones are natural disasters, uh, plagues and uh, uh, plagues and climate changes and things like that. And, uh, of course, my favorite one is when the, when the Hittites come over and kill everybody in Babylon. Uh, Mikhail Heffernson, would you be interested in appearing on The Daily Show again? Guys, you, that's your job. You tell them you want me to be on. They know who I am. I've been on before. Um, uh, we have, uh, we have a meeting of minds on this stuff. You probably know that our differences is that I don't. I like solutions, not criticism. Uh, the Daily the Daily Show uh, is part of the alt right movement to desensitize by ridicule uh, the things that are used to uh, push guilt onto us. And so uh, when you so they want to know, you know, they usually want to ask me how I'm going to work in a revolution, and I'm only going to tell this much. Um, you know, I tend to ignore the racial stuff, whatever, because. You know, I view it as universal nationalism, uh, that we all can transcend as long as we all uh, parent our lower classes. So uh, there's, I'm not sure that, you know, if they want to talk about something and you want me to talk about something, pick a topic, tell them that's what you want to talk about, and I'll go on. Well, I mean, Mr. Hager, you can disagree all you want. I'm just going by the numbers. As education increases, church goes down. As science increases, spirituality goes down. The people who go to church tend to be the people who are old and the people who are bright. The people who are hopeless. That's just how it is. Um, what I believe in is the families should go to church and that the church is good for families. And you see this really strongly in American evangelicalism. But I would say if you're going to want to take that to the urban this is you know, more than half a society. You're going to have to do it the way I recommend. Now, I'm going to tell you another thing about churches. You have feelings that you associate with the content, but there's nothing to the content at all. The reason you feel good is the experience. It's not what you're told. I can tell you, you can bring people to church and talk about freaking anything as long as you create that experience. It doesn't make any difference. So if I brought, uh, made a new church and I talked about uh, different things, as long as it invoked the same submission response, which is submission to the pack, so that we were all binding uh, subconsciously to each other, then that would give us incredible sense of peace, and we would defend that feeling crazily like everyone else in the world does. There's nothing special about Christianity that, other than you know, it's in you know, all the Indo-European stuff in it. How can we reform the? We don't can reform the United States. We shut it down. There's no reason for it. It's just a bunch of bloodsuckers. There's nothing that needs to be done in the United Nations that can't be done on the in real time communication today. Well, and uh, Terry and yeah, I don't debate. Uh, spirituality is for spiritual things for people. I my problem is law. I do Caesar, you guys can do whatever you want, but I don't talk about it. 
because I know it's a lie. Um, this is a smart question, John. Uh, where do you see proper terrorism going and what kind of data can we collect that's not available to us now? Um, you know, the reason we actually can't collect good economic data is fear. Um, uh, we all know that it would, we would, if we had uh, multiple credit cards, different kinds of currencies on each credit card, and that, and that we could use those uh, in different, for different things, like I could use one kind of credit card for food, and another one kind for, for my rent, and another one for what, medical. We could have all these cards and uh, we could do it. The problem is we can't trust the government as it's currently structured to not screw with this and use it as a means of controlling people. So the, se so the second thing is uh, there's no reason we can't see how money moves to the economy and other people have done research on how to construct a, uh, a, new, a new kind of tagged accounting system that would see how things move through the economy. We have the informational capacity to do this we have uh, uh, we can bring up a new era of blockchain to better track it, um, and so there's no reason we can't put this stuff together. It'd be really simple. Just have the you know government buy Mastercard. It's a shit product anyway. It sells to losers and tries to scam them. Um, buy the Mastercard system. Uh, keep Visa and Visa as the main uh, commercial system, and let's issue different cards for different purposes, different currencies for different purposes, and we'll be all. It will be all nice and fun, and we'd have a lot of data about how things actually work. The problem is we can't do that, or anything even close to that, if we can't stop the government from using it to lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, bribe, lie, cheat, and steal. So where do I see propertarianism going? Um, you know, uh, I, I know I'm pretty confident about one thing. I'm pretty confident about testimonialism. Even if the propertarian program uh, of ethics uh, was never to make it to fruition in my lifetime in government, I'm pretty sure that testimonialism's got legs for eternity. And I'm pretty sure that the same impact that was caused by reason in the Greek world, science and empiricism in the uh, English world, and, uh, and testimonialism in the information age, I'm pretty sure those con the consequences of each era are equal. Because I have a vague idea of what happens to us when there's not so much error and deceit in the common vernacular, just as I have an idea of what happens when we got rid of mysticism and when we first invented reason and could structure ideas. So these are, you know, I'm pretty confident I understand how that changes human because I know how it changes mine. So I'm pretty confident that you're going to see propertarianism, uh, uh, that part of propertarianism go. Uh, my feeling about the political structures is, is I want to create demands. By creating demands, in other words, I want us to have a constitution that we're going to demand and we're going to threaten with revolution. I think that's really good marketing for propertarianism, honestly, that even if it didn't work, the very fact that we talk about it, and we talk about it intensely, if it doesn't change tomorrow, it changes humanity at some point. Um, so these are the ways I, I sort of look at it. And I'm kind of amazed by all this stuff, because really, I didn't set out to do it. I just sort of stumbled on it. <clears throat> uh, I agree with the, uh, Jim Goldstein. I agree on the culture critique argument. Uh, I tend to th see things as conspiracy of common interest, given mental framing. In other words, I, I don't attribute too much agency to people. Uh, I actually I make the comment, and uh, in my, I, I really don't like... Uh, I want to come out against what I call Jewish thought, but it's not really a racist thing. So uh, my view is that the, 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 the problem here is that a people grew up with a bunch of rules, and they, that's natural to them. And I always make the joke, that I, and I, but it's, I actually mean it, is I say all Jews are female. What I mean is that the Jewish culture has adopted the female strategy of critique or criticism or gossip. And it works. Now, it works for women. It worked for Jewish people. Now, the reason it does stops working for women is we smack them around, 
And uh, now we're not allowed to smack them around, so we need to create institutions to do the smacking for us, or at least prohibit the damage done by their gossip. And the same thing has to do with Jewish people. They're just doing what sounds right to them and pursuing their reproductive interests. Um, uh, you know, I don't, uh, you know, they, they don't, f people don't sit there and say, I'm going to be a liar. You know, they just follow their impulses, the tools that are available to them, what they've learned in their traditions. That's what we got. So to me, uh, I view their argument as right, but I, I, I always view it as, what are you going to do? You know, I, I, I don't, it's only you complain about anybody. You can complain about the Catholics. I mean, the Catholics were catastrophic for America. Uh, the Jews were catastrophic for America. Blacks have been catastrophic for America. Why? Because the Protestants came here to create a eugenic society, and we let Catholics in, and we brought blacks in, and we brought Jews in, and all these people have just the opposite agenda. So, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm I just not interested in criticism. I want to know how to stop it, and so that's why I work on institutions. I thought you don't like this submission part. I don't understand that question, Christopher Thomas Sulo. Uh, submission. Oh, uh, sorry. I see what you're saying. When I say the reason, when we say we feel spiritual, what we're actually doing is, uh, in our brain state, we're invoking that feeling of running with the pack. Now, if you can imagine what a dog feels like, how happy he is when he's running with the pack, that's us. You know, we're, 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 we're you know, I always think it's kind of funny we have this concept of the wolf man, but that's actually us. That's who we are. We're the wolf man. We run together in packs. And, uh, and that feeling is really uh, is uplifting. It's euphoric. And so the secret to church is, is taking all these individuals and putting the pack back together. And we, we do this by uh, the same way we do with dogs. You make them feel very safe and very comfortable, and you be calm. And if you make all the dogs calm, the leadership dog gets calm, the rest of the dogs will get calm. Well, it's the same thing with human beings. You put us in that calm state, state. We do it enough, we get used to it. It's euphoric. And it also allows us to be uh, preached to, taught to very well. So you can't do it for endless number of hours because we can't all sit through that. But for some period of time, especially the way the Protestants used to do it, you'd go listen to the sermon for an hour, but then you could get up and speak your mind and debate and criticize for a while, which is where all that smart stuff came from the Founding Fathers, is that, that kind of society. So I'm talking about submission to the pack, in other words, the invoking the submission to the pack response. I'm not saying that we should submit to some mystical authority and uh, and and throw reason out the window when it comes to uh, comes to literature. Book, bu butch, Unitarian, Unitarian Universalism is the proof of your theory about the feeling of the church. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, my my view is that the problem is is that that's, that's a little bit hippie, and I want to turn it aggressive. In other words, I want to make it aristocracy. I want to teach high art. Uh, I don't have any real comments on the Bitcoin. I've said as much as I can about Bitcoin and Ethereum. I actually think it's pretty easy. Uh, Jeremy Mackle. Your reading list is vast and very useful, but there's sort of... I'll actually post, uh, the, but there's already stuff out there that's pretty good. I'm not real. I mean, uh, I don't need to come up with that work because it's been done. I can't remember who does it right. Somebody might pull this up because whenever I talk about it, somebody does. Um, there's plenty of research out there on the basics. I think the the uh, wig tradition is fantastic for children. Uh, I my big thing is Aesop's fairy tales, uh, Aesop's uh, fables, fairy tales. Uh, read the kids' uh, uh, heroic stories, uh, keep them in the I want to be a prince or princess model, and th that's pretty good. Aside from that, uh, the, the, the heroic tradition, as long as you keep the heroic tradition, you're probably fine. Um, I'm more concerned about what do we do about adults. Um, Matthew, when, uh, somebody's, could you... I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. It's Matye Lovrich. Uh, if you could, if you could show me how to pronounce that at some point, I'd appreciate it. Um, when you say Athens was on the verge of the industrial revolution, what do you mean specifically by that? Well, we—you've probably seen that. Uh, 
was Antikythera device. Uh, it's got a lot of gears. You can calculate uh, um, uh, Montek. Okay, um, you can calculate uh, orbits with it. And so, the, the, once you can produce gears of that quality, and you have that understanding. Um, the math exists to create complex machinery that can calculate. Um, the problem even Babbage had, you know, Babbage could have created a computer if we'd have, um, uh, we'd had a little better equipment in the early 1800s, and if we had, uh, the world would be a very different place. I think most people know this. Um, it wasn't until we got electric uh, uh, transistors that we could have precise enough switching to be able to uh, do computation at any speed. But you know, they, people have built Babbage's machines now uh, in uh, using his basic plans, and they work just fine. Um, so once you have that gear, that's sort of like the secret. Uh, from there, it's just energy. We saw steam power coming about. Um, it was very, very close. So uh, if you look at the the kind of wealth, the way the institutions were working, uh, and, you know, if they hadn't exhausted themselves in this ridiculous war, um, it looks like they would have hit the Industrial Revolution. You can just see the similarities between the evolution of reason in the Greek world, uh, the smaller world than it was in English, but, and you can see what happened in England. It's basically following the same trajectory. Nothing novel about my observation here, by the way. Lots of people think this. Opinions on Gary, whatever his name is. Johnson. Oh, uh, I met Gary a couple times. You know, I've I've had enough conversation with him. Gary Gary has a vagina, and that's my opinion of Gary. He's a very nice man, totally unsuitable for the presidency, and uh, total and and uh, he's the kind of guy you want to run your business. He's a kind of mayor you want to have for your small town. Uh, he probably was okay as the governor of Arizona, but uh, you can't uh, remember the the head of America is the head of a military industrial con uh, military industrial complex, and he's also the spiritual leader of the American people, and he's just unsuitable to it. As much as I like the guy, he's unsuitable. I mean, it's like saying I mean I wouldn't be a great president either. I know it. I mean. Um, great question, relative commotion. What was art school like in the late, 18, late, late 1970s? Well, uh, at that time, uh, the pop art movement and the minimalist art movement were still around, and art, uh, and art at least in New York, was still political. Uh, what happened since the 80s is that Hollywood's become such a sucking sound, and uh, culture has been so useless that there's no, honestly, very little art is, is, is very good. It's actually hard to find art that isn't uh, horrible. Um, uh, what we have seen is the craftsmanship con tra trend continue. Um, we've seen that continue. And we have seen really interesting work in metalwork and jewelry. Um, we've seen, uh, but, and, uh, but I tend to see most of the interventions happen in the craft sphere uh, during the economic boom, which always happens. And uh, I have seen nothing impressive come out of the art field at all. So the 70s was cool in the sense that it was very experimental. It was very theoretical. Um, uh, I, my, my, you don't know this, but my art school, which is the University of Hartford, Hartford Art School, was uh, put together based uh, as a theory based on Ayn Rand's uh, theory of aesthetics. I didn't know that at the time. I actually didn't know who Ayn Rand was. And, but what I got was this very fantastic time and place this art education where I got theory, uh, political art from New York, um, uh, the change from pop to, you know, pop art, uh, this social ridicule stuff, to minimalism, which was the uh, study of materials and forms and, and uh, how space would change there. Um, the, uh, it was just a wonderful time. And you used to go to New York every Wednesday, uh, first Wednesday of every month and spend the whole day walking through galleries and it seemed like every gallery had something interesting different in it whereas if you go like anytime from 1994 it's all the same crap 
Uh, so for me, it was really, really wonderful, but it was a period in time you can't capture again. Um, when I went to school, you got to, I, you had your theory classes, and you basically it was like what I, you know, it's where I got this technique from. I use is you go into a room, they throw up stuff on the wall, and you critique it, and you say this is good about it, whatever. But if you say anything like weaselly, they, they they jump all over you. So you have to say something meaningful, and so you're generally saying something good or bad or whatever. This is right. This could be bad or whatever, and that kind of. Uh, insight is just you can't get it it's like what they do in graduate school with business studies business case studies we were doing an art and it was fantastic then you go from that you go to the craftsmanship so you've got sculpture and ceramics and printing and video and film and video and drawing and painting and you know you're learning all these skills i spent so much time drawing nude people i can't tell you uh my favorite stories are the difference between uh Nancy Johnson, who was an unattractive lesbian, brought in the worst-looking people in the world, and Rudy Zallinger, who was a, a Russian guy, who was from you know upper upper middle class or lower aristocracy. He was the guy who had painted the first dinosaurs with colors back in the back in the day, and he would bring in these hot you know hot ballerinas and things like this, and you'd be like, I don't know if I can draw. <laughs> anyway, it was a, it was a really great period. Uh, Alex Jim Golsa came how Hamart you know, society outside of ethno nationalism. Uh, you, if you have enough extra wealth, uh, you can cover a lot of sins. Uh, it isn't when we're wealthy that problems that that our differences are an issue, and it isn't our upper class that our differences are an issue. The problem is when things become narrow, our working classes are the ones that pay. And so the problem is conflict between working classes and uh, middle classes and lower classes when scarcity arises. And it's this competition, or, or when there's a competition, like can you have in our government, where people have access to the government, can use it to benefit one tribe or the other. The great thing about monarchy is it's a private government, it's national, they can put up little sections of the city where people have, but you have no access to power. So the Jews didn't have access to power in the Austrian society, for example. And um, so they have to do things in the, pub in the commercial sphere, in the intellectual sphere, if they want to have status. And this is what I really like about the private uh, monarchies, is that there's no access to political power. So if you want status, and we do want people to status, if you want advantage, you have to achieve it in the market. I think I did Gary Johnson already. Um, Gary has a vagina. You know, it's just how I view most libertarians. Um... Devin, I'm a very, um, I, I want to go look at this guy, before, uh, what's his name, uh, Neil, Neil McLaren's work. I haven't read it, but I'll go look at it after we get off the line tonight. Although, what time is it? I don't know what time it is. Um, what do you think about the universal universalism of heroism today? Can anyone become a hero? Uh, it's all about feel. No, I think the problem with heroism is the movie business. In other words, uh, we have some very bad people in charge of our uh, narratives, and they have some very bad, and worse, they have malincentives. Uh, the problem with the movie business is copyright laws. So we're artificially funding things that have low value. And so we're basically creating uh, slapstick and uh, you know, dick and fart jokes uh, artistically at, at economic scale, and we're letting the Sundance Film Festival produce art. Well, uh, produce movies. Well, you know, of course, if we stopped copyright, the only thing you could produce is the stuff that goes on at Sundance, and uh, and we wouldn't have we, because you wouldn't be able to make money at uh, all this bad stuff. Um, so that's my uh, my appeal. Um, now, when you say, I'll just say this, uh, uh, heroism. So the the problem you get with heroism is this: is that if you have a local market. You can have a lot of different heroes, but most because all heroism is some kind of in-groups versus some kind of out-group. So the only thing you can do on the international market is, uh, I'm a daddy protecting my daughter. I'm a daddy protecting my brother. 
You know, and I, I love this humor. Says you, you, the Asian stuff can't sell here because nobody gives a shit about your brother. <laughs> it's not heroic. <laughs> um, uh, yet well, the problem for America is we can't produce anything that isn't heroic without aliens and supermen because you need you need Mexican drug dealers. You need uh, you need uh, you know you need commies. You need you need, you need some bad guy. And and, and there's uh, to create real heroism, a sense that the hero is acting on your behalf that you can empathize with that you can feel heroic about and so we have two bad incentives um, basically both are from copyrights is that if you, I'm, I'm seeing all these little strange things keep going across my screen emotional reactions I don't know what what emotions they're reacting to but uh, heroism is just difficult to construct when you have copyright which basically copyright, and uh, you have you you have an because of that uh, you can create big expensive projects that have to make money on the international market, which can't use heroic stories. So the only thing that you can do this is like you know Marvel comics is, is the only stuff that can sell internationally because the only thing is to heroic. And then they make other stuff. They try to be heroic, and it's complete freaking tragedy. You know, or you see you get the the the, the Jewish heroism of. Uh, what was the, what was the, uh, <coughs> the last uh, Mars movie, um, uh, World of the Worlds movie, um, where you know the guy's heroic by running away, by being a coward. Uh, the kids are whiny. It's not heroic. You know, our people stand up. They, we get a shield wall together. We get up and we fight. and said, "Come at me, fuckers!" You know, that's what heroic is to us. Well, uh, everything is selfish today. Well, everything's always selfish. You know, Alex, I couldn't give a shit about the National Socialist anything. It's a, mid it's a lower middle class wet dream. You know, uh, they had a really good idea. They overreached and they screwed up. And you know what? It's dead. The only thing we can do is we can look for something new. And I know it's comforting to go back to what we understood and to feel that you know, we can feel some sense of vindication or just justification or for whatever. But honestly, they just screwed up. And they were screwed up big time. <coughs> there's nothing good about the econ an economy in Nazism. What there's good about it is aesthetics. They made a beautiful movement. And they, they talked about beauty. And, and, and they tried to restore our people to truth and beauty. Now, they did that through lots of bad means, unfortunately. Uh, and, and they overextended, and they got the whole world in trouble. Now, I, I, I'm actually very sympathetic with the Germans. I think we are always wrong in the reaction to the Germans. Got to get out of the air, let them and the Russians get together and uh, and, and and solve the eternal problem. And but uh, you know, uh, talking about the past, this past stuff is just jerking off. I mean, everybody gets pissed at me when I say it because you want to hold that wet dream, but it's what it is—a wet dream. Yeah, can you rebut the futurologists who claim advancement of technology? Well, I mean, you know, the the, the rebuttal to these people uh, that uh, that uh, growth will fix everything is is uh, uh, twofold. One is that uh, one is that <clears throat> we uh, moved a lot of people off the farm into labor. And now we're moving the labor, and there's nowhere for them to go. And uh, so uh, we did that by Petro. By the, I mean, you could actually argue that all this human achievement that we congratulate ourselves over is nothing more than the dividends of petrochemicals, you know, accumulated hydrocarbons. And I'm actually one of the guys that thinks that. So, uh, you know... Uh, you, know, you, you free you know you free up a lot of people to do other things when you have a lot of energy coming from other sources. So uh, you know the first thing I have to to say is that um, uh, <clears throat> is that uh, growth is isn't a given. Uh, there's no uh, surety that we haven't already, at least in the physical world, basically maximized what's actionable. Um, I think there's certainly in the biological and computable world we haven't maximized what's actionable. We're certainly going to be able to do a lot with genetics and all of that. 
but I still don't know how that's going to affect, going to keep a whole lot of people employed. You know, the West, we had a great 500-year advantage. I mean, we had, we basically, we're like aliens that came and visited Earth with a huge technologically av technological advantage, and all our middle and lower, uh, working and lower classes benefited from that huge increase that was produced. And, you know, we conquered the whole world with this, just like aliens from outer space. Now, uh, we don't have that advantage anymore. Not only that, it was, we used to be 15% of the population, and now we're nothing. So we don't have that anymore. So, so when I look at it, how is it going to feel? Well, I'm all happy and good if they think it's going to fix it. But as the aggregate, you know, we're having, well, yeah, we have a, an effect of the spread of scientific knowledge and the spread of health that's raising uh, uh, average IQs. But the real truth of the matter is, you know, the, the more these people at the bottom we get, the dumber we get. And so I don't know, I always wonder, the end is probably, I see it, is not a tech, I don't see the future being Star Wars, I mean a Star Wars or Star Trek, where you have, a, basically you've eliminated everything except the upper middle class from the gene pool. Uh, I view it as um, uh, South America or the Arab world, where you have the vast majority of people are below, uh, uh, you know, are, the, the size of the underclass is so large, there's no productivity available in the economy to incentivize a, the hierarchy from top to bottom and therefore organize the society to do anything. So my view is, no, we're going to, I don't think we're going to see that. I think we're going to decivilize. I think right now we're still reaping the product, the, the benefits, the 19th century, petroleum products, and the, uh, but there's no, there's no evidence that our technology that we have today, our computing technologies, which is where all the wealth is coming from right now, uh, the expansion is coming from, there's no evidence that's actually increasing productivity at all. Where's the productivity? Every economy knows, every economist knows this. It's not, I don't, so, so, you know, I'm not a pessimist. I think there's options out there. I think the issue, though, is we haven't solved the core problem, which is the size of the underclass and the reproductive rate of the underclasses we've enabled by uh, the use of petrochemicals. Of course, Spengler was right. I mean, I agree with Spengler. I'm, I'm one of the guys that says we screwed up when we fought Germany. Germany was right. They should have won the First World War. <clears throat> no humor. Hi, Saren. Uh, I think, yes, I think Italy would be much better off if they undid their unification. The problem is they'd have a South America, North America program that they'd build a wall across it because really the South is just shit, honestly. And um, the, the, there's no business down there. Uh, there's no industry down there. And uh, if you've ever been through Naples, you'll understand. I mean, it's just, you know, that's not a bad one. So uh, I, I think, you know, I would undo it for sure. I mean, I'd undo most of this unification stuff. <laughs> we actually incentivize the bottom class next to the gene pool. Uh, you can, people like the good life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is still live. What should I study in college? Uh, getting laid. Yes, this is still live, Gene. Well, baby bonus is going to be a disaster. That's it's not enough of an incentive. It's got to be big. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's possible to incentivize really the the uh, uh, the upper classes. I think we should uh, is so much as it is to disincentivize the lower classes. Personal heroes. Hmm. Great opportunity to say something funny, and I've got nothing. Um, the, I, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't really have too many, honestly. 
I tend to look, uh, when I was younger, I, I uh, lionized Alexander. When I was older, I, uh, I've uh, come to feel a kindred spirit with uh, Hayek. He's the person I, uh, <clears throat> he's the person I basically associate with most. Um, and I actually don't associate with too many others. Um, that's probably my probably my view of it. Uh, you know, uh, I read a lot of science fiction as a kid. I uh, got very lucky. I was in that period between where the fifth, the fifth, the golden age in the fifties and sixties and seventies, and we had the uh, constant fear of nuclear war, which created a sense of uh, urgency and a, a sense of dread and a sense of searching, soul-searching, of mist searching for solutions and myths. And I found that that was, uh, 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 that created some very good literature. And I tended to, uh, I think I'm very affected by that. Um, Harlan Ellison was very important to me. Robert Heinlein was from, actually, that's probably the other one. Heinlein's probably the other guy I identify with uh, very uh, carefully. Um, uh, of course, uh, it's hard not to identify with Michelangelo because he was such an autistic spaz. <laughs> He's just, what a, what a, what a, he was really a foul human being, really dirty, never changed his clothes, slept in them, uh, uh, wouldn't look at people in the eye, you know, <laughs> you know but anyway. <clears throat> I don't do wishful thinking, guys. Philip Saunders, how do we transition to market commons? Well, you know, it's not actually that hard. Uh, we already have houses of government. We already have laws at work. We just put a constitution in place. We change some, change the institutional structure. People are very smart. They'll adapt very, very quickly. Uh, you know, the, the 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 idea that we can circumvent monopoly commons is is not. I don't know why that's so difficult. Uh, the, re the, the idea that you'd be prohibited, you could be stopped from passing a law because it's actually illegal, I, I think that's great. As a matter of fact, I can't imagine people would uh, do that. I think mean, the problem you're going to get from the left is that they don't want to trade. They want to get. The problem you're going to get, you know, I think the, you know, the, that, that's just a normal human reaction. And you're going to get, certainly going to get problems from the, 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 the rent-seeking sector, I mean, God, look at the financial sector. I don't know who you want to marry, dude. You know, I, you know women, are, women are like magic, you know. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't like, you know, marrying outside of my little world. Um... Uh, I married. I was very in a marriage for, for twenty years, the, the, very successful. And if I hadn't gotten cancer for the second time and made me a little crazy there, uh, f fearful. Because when you get very sick, you don't realize your body knows you're sick, and it changes your mind, and you don't understand what's wrong. And so uh, I, I just my, every threat in the world seemed a lot bigger to me. And so uh, you know, I was. And she, she's, uh, you know, same genetic gene pool as I am, more Nor Norwegian, and I'm probably got more uh, Denmark in me, but um, uh, that worked out great. Um, you know, I, I don't really see, I, I mean, that seems to be metaphys uh, metaphysical value judgments, Ayn Rand again. Um, as long as you have similar metaphysical value judgments, that's great. Uh, if you feel awkward in the social and family situations, I would say it's bad. Um, the problem is over time is those those underlying physical assumptions they matter more to you and the simple stuff like the it person's interesting or different or special or sexy that goes away so you know I'm sort of in the you know marry somebody that, that has the same values as you are and you do and you're gonna have a longer marriage because the marriage is the most expensive decision you make after your house and your car <clears throat> What do you think of the semi-nomadic lifestyle? Well, I'm sort of adopting it, right? I mean, I sold my house, my cars, everything, and I'm just a lot happier. Um, 
I suppose I might like a little cabin in the woods somewhere where I could go uh, get away from it all, but I actually really like the urban nomad lifestyle. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the, the answer I'd want to give you. Okay, can I, can I, uh, is that it? Is that all the questions I've gone through? All right, I hope this was uh, fun for you. It was kind of really interesting for me to be able to talk to people and, uh, and, uh, and answer things. Uh, uh, I was surprised at the breadth of questions and the number of people. We've hovered around 30 participants the whole time. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, crash and have a good night. Uh, thank all of you for coming, and we'll try this again. So have a good night.